Those of you that were here Wednesday night heard my voice leave on me, and um, and so I'm going to do my best. My wife said, who's going to preach tomorrow? I said, either me or you, one of the two. <laughs> and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to fall back on Daniel's defense. Daniel was asleep, and he had a dream, and... Um, he wrote down that dream, and we've been talking about that dream. Well, last night I fell asleep, and I woke up, and I had, I had this on my mind. Can I just give you what I felt like the Lord dropped in my soul? Let's stand together, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to... Um, do something I really don't like to do. I like, I wish I had the time to give you the entire context of the scripture, but I don't, but it's such rich material. And so we're going to go down to verse 7 and start reading in verse 7. Uh, Saints of the Most High, right here in Dinuba, I love you. I just want you to know that. What an awesome privilege it is to pastor you good people. And um, just thankful to be a part of what God is doing. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, <coughs> there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I, I've been feeling this. I mean, I physically, I'm not up to it. I, I would like to be that, that 25-year-old evangelist again that had a lot of mm and fire. I can't do that. But God has been working on me. That my strength is made perfect in weakness. For while I am weak, He's strong. Oh, glory. God, do your divine work. God, do your divine work. I pray in the name of Jesus. Glorify your name in this house. And I praise you. I glorify you. I worship you, Jesus. Come on, people. Clap your hands under the Lord. For he is worthy. For he is worthy. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. One of my most cherished memories was a time pastoring there in New Chapel, um, Mississippi, when my oldest son Darby came running, calling for me, not Angie, not Mama, for me to take a splinter out of his foot. The old deck that was around the uh, in-ground swimming pool in the backyard uh, was getting older and, and parts of that pine were starting to stick up you had to be careful and really needed to be wearing deck shoes I mean swimming shoes or something around that but 
But regardless, he had run around that deck in one of those old gray slivers of pine and went up into his foot, the big old sliver, and uh, he went to crying for daddy. That always made me feel good when the boys did that. Just want to go na 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 to uh, the other party in the relationship. But it seemed like that the bigger the splinter, the easier it is to remove. It's, it, you can get to them, you can get a grip on it, you can get a handle on it. The ones that are really hard to deal with are those tiny little thorns, those little cactus thorns, those little bitty slivers of metal or whatever it may be. Those can elude you and they're so sharp that when you touch them, they just seem like they drive further in the foot and it just, it's harder, it just, mm. The Apostle Paul admits to us that he was a man given to great spiritual visions. God used him to write two-thirds of your New Testament. Uh, he was a tremendous educated, well-educated man. He had sat at the feet of one of the greatest minds in Jewish history. And uh, he had had some tremendous things, but, but all of his education aside, uh, T.F. Tenney said, get a good education and then get over it. <laughs> and all of those things that he had, what really made him such a unique individual was the fact that he had some great spiritual visions. He talked about, I knew a man 14 years ago, whether in the body, out of the body, that's the context of this verse. Uh, he was carried up into the third heaven. He had revelations that God had given to him, insights into scriptures, deep, deep concepts that many other people struggle to deal with, struggle to understand. But, but he had some experiences with God. He had, he had times that he had been at places, established works. He had the goods. He had the corn in the crib. He had earned the right to say the things that he said. He cloaked a lot of his things in a third-person terminology just like he did in this chapter, but it doesn't take long to figure out exactly who he was talking about because, but Paul tried not to exalt himself. He, he would say things as, I magnify my office, you know, and he, he did all of that, but, but he was greatly used of God, and our all-wise God knows how to remind us sometimes just how and where and why we have been blessed with the health, the finances, the talents, the beauty, or just plain favor that God has given us. He, he knows how to remind us where the source was, where it came from, and what it was to be used for. Because reality of it is, it's not because of us. We're not good enough, we're not pretty enough, we're not smart enough, but it is by him and it's in him and it is through him that all of these things are done. It's all about him, not me. It's about him. The whole thing surrounds the concept of how great our God is and he has a plan and we get to be a portion of his plan. It's not the plan that surrounds us. We're just a small fraction of the purpose and the plan of God in the earth. Someone shout amen. amen. The psalmist said, my strength cometh from the Lord. Everything that I have, everything I do comes from him. So, to prevent Paul from becoming proud, self-reliant, God allows a messenger to buffet his flesh. His flesh. Even though we are full of the Spirit, we have been born again of the water and, and the blood, and we, we have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We're citizens of another country. We're still stuck living down here in this world. We still live in the flesh. And that flesh constantly fights against everything that God is doing, tries to prevent the things of God because the two of them don't communicate well. They don't get along well. 
So God gave Paul a thorn in the threat, flesh, an irritant, an aggravation, something that worked on him constantly. You can still function with a thorn in the flesh, but it brings constant pain. There's a reminder that something has gotten underneath your skin. You know, that thing that besets you, that thing that keeps bothering you, that thing that keeps keeps holding you down, that thing that brings so much frustrations, that, that thing. And so God uh, was, God permitted this for one reason, and that was to keep Paul from getting exalted above measure. In other words, so that you don't get too big for your own britches. I've told you all the story. Some of you may not have heard it, but uh, by the way, I'm wearing a brand new suit. Thank God for Calvary Apostolic Church. <laughs> I, told, I told Laura I bought four of them for the price they wanted to charge me for one. <laughs> same brands, same, not, not cheap, same brand. Anyway, so I had just bought one of my first Hart, Shafter, and Mark suits, which I love Hart, Shafter, and Marks. This is not one of them, but it's close to it. But, but I had bought a Hart, Shafter, and Marks. It, it, they are so fine. You put it in a suitcase, get to where you're going, take it out, shake it out. The wrinkles aren't there. It's just they're fine clothes. They just, and I was so proud. I had just been elected as the district home missions director for Mississippi, and uh, calls were coming in, and, and I was getting, you know, I could set on certain things and get go to headquarters and be one of the guys up in headquarters and, you know, <clears throat> see who I'm becoming. And um, so one of my duties as home missions director is we had a, we had a daughter work that was planted up in um, Philadelphia area of Mississippi. And, and so the pastor asked me, he said, Brother Bodie, would you come for the dedication of our, of our new building on this daughter work? Would you speak for it? And so I did, even though it meant a three-hour drive um, one way, I, or almost three hours, maybe it was two hours. I left my service fairly early in, in New Chapel. I drove up there above Interstate I-20. I, I was a part of that, preached that, and sat down afterwards to fellowship for just a little bit. They took us outside, and they had some old wooden benches, and um, sun and rain and wood does not coalesce very good together. And I sat down and I felt a tug on my backside. And I, I didn't think too much about it because it didn't stay there very, I mean, it was just a slight tug. And so I, I, I left there and I went back home and I preached at home that night and I had a long full day and God was in it and next week next week was was a conference in Columbia Mississippi um, a big big meeting and so now I'm the big home missions director for the state I get a little attention from these guys that didn't give me any attention there before and, and I, I go in there and I'm wearing my new heart shafter marks Window pane, blue suit. I'm I'm styling and profiling. I'm, <laughs> and I sat down in a special room. We we had a split minister session, and I sat down in one of those chairs, and I felt something cool on the back of my leg, and I'm like, what is that? Is there a wet spot on this? And I reached back there, and my brand new beautiful suit has got a three-quarter corner tear in the backside of my britches. It's the most expensive suit I had bought to date at that point. It was, it was a gorgeous suit, I'm telling you. And, and, and I, I will never forget it because, because 
That was the, that was the service that Brian Kinsey was talking about, the hand of God upon your life. And he was talking about all the pressures that was on his life and all the things that, that he was facing. And he told God, have you ever reached the point where you feel like you can't take anymore? He said, I told God, I said, God, you've got to take this pressure off of me. I can't handle anymore. And God said, what you're feeling is my hand upon you. Do you want me to lift it off? And Brother Kinsey said, no, no, God, you just leave it right where it's at. And I'm, I'm hearing that with torn britches. I went back, and, and, and I had a seamstress there in the church, and I asked her, I said, do you think you can do it? And she said, yeah, there's ways now that we can, we can work on those fabrics and bring them back together again. Well, it was beyond her ability and, and the best she could do was put a patch in it, and she, she sewed it up. She came to me. She was literally at tears, the point of tears. As Sister Cheryl told me, said, said, I want to, Brother Bodie. I tried my best, but she said, you can still see it. I said, that's fine, sis, because what God did is he said, he said son, I wore those, those, that suit for years with that patch in the back of my seat. Because I felt like God said, son, don't you ever forget. Don't get too big for your britches. And I don't care how good you are, and I don't care how much you can do for the kingdom of God, and I don't care anything else about how you're used of God or anything. Don't get too big for your britches. Don't get to the place where you're overconfident. And it's not just ministry. It's not just leadership. But you can get confident in your walk with God and to the point where you don't keep investing into it like you ought to and, and do things. And, and, and life is going on so good that you don't feel like you have to. But God, in his loving mercy, will put something in your path to make you keep praying, to keep humble, to keep tender in the face of God. Three times Paul sought God and said, God, I want you to take this thorn from me. Would you please pull out the tweezers and would you please pull out the needle and take this thing from me? We don't know what Paul's thorn was. We have no clue what Paul's thorn was. We are not told in the scripture. Some people think it was his eyesight. Some people think it was his speech because he, even though he was highly intellectual, his speech was a little different. And some people think it was his stature. Some people think it was his health things. Who knows what it was? I don't know. Some even think it was his wife. <coughs> <clears throat> but we don't know. But when you ask God for personal comfort and you ask God to take some of that pain away that you deal with, you just be ready to accept that sometimes God may say no. The answer is as deep as the deep blue sea and it's as simple as ABC. God said my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. It's not your experiences. It's not, it's not the talent. It's not all of the things, your intellect. It's not all of that. But I'm telling you, when you have that besetting issue and you have those things that you face every day of your life, you're going to have to come to one understanding, and that is you're only here by the grace of God. But my grace is sufficient for thee. What, what you need more than anything else is that undergirding of the grace of God. You've got something God's allowed you to go through. You've got something God's allowed you to deal with and face. But just remember that he's given you the remedy to deal with it, and that is the grace of God. You've got the best Rx there is. You've got the best pharmacy that there is in the fact that what you cannot do on your own. Thank God that he left a limp in, 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 in uh, Jacob so that Jacob could be reminded that he had a name change and things were different than they used to be. God is leaving you with some things to make you remember. <coughs> I 
I thought about this after I put my notes together. Um, my last year of Stockton Bible College, I bought a 72 uh, Mercury Capri, and I didn't know at the time it was actually a pretty hot little sports car. It had had a little ding and whatnot and didn't look perfect, and sun had baked its leather seats, and they had split and cracked, and I had taken some towels that had a Navajo Indian rug motif on it, and I'd covered those seats up, and it looked pretty good. It, it really did, and when it was running like it ought to run, I, it, it ran faster than it should have ran because I tested it out. But I started evangelizing, and that stupid thing got this cough. I know now what the problem was, but I didn't know what it was back then. But I'm telling you, every time I pulled up somebody where, where there was somebody I want to re impress, that thing backfired. <laughs> People look around like somebody just shot somebody, you know? And, and take a, go out on a date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They look at you like, what's wrong with your car? And I, I, I will never forget. Some of those things went on. I went to a general conference one time, and we had had issues and things, and it seemed like every time I went to a general conference, I either got a great big fever blister or I was broke financially or one thing and another took place, you know. Uh, we'd have car problems took Brother Travis out to eat one time and locked the keys in the car, couldn't even get in the car. You know, God, why? Why do these things happen? And God spoke to me and he reminded me. He said, it's because I want you to know that there's people here that are hurting and suffering. And you need to quit thinking about just your own little problems, your own issues, because there's people here that need your compassion and your love, and they're going through things just like I'm showing you about. I'm preaching in the Holy Ghost. I know I'm not loud, and I know I'm not screaming, I know I'm not what I'd like to do, but I'm talking to you in the Holy Ghost, because if God let you run your own life, and if God allowed you to pull every obstacle and trouble and things out of your life, you, you couldn't, you, you'd be so stinking proud, you couldn't live with you. But God is in his mercy, is keeping you humble enough in all of that, that he's given you grace Grace, somebody say grace. Grace is such a powerful word because you've got to understand what grace does. When grace walks in, you'll stand up straighter. When grace comes in, you'll work harder. When grace walks in, you'll do things you could not do on, on your own. I'm talking about the power of God. When God's grace comes in, you can throw away the cigarettes. When God's grace comes in, you can give up the alcohol. When God's grace comes in, the things you used to love, you won't love anymore. When God's grace comes in, it is the in divine influence on a life. And it's reflection uh, in, in, a, in our heart. It's when God comes in and suddenly we don't want to do those things anymore because we want to rise to the level of the expectation of, that God has for our lives. It's when grace walks in that it empowers us to do what we could not do. The revelation, dear saints of God, that strength is, is perfected in weakness. It's in the time that I am weak I find out that he is strong. It's not in what I have. It's in my dependency upon what he has. <clears throat> Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. By nature, we respect strength. We want to lead from a position of strength, not weakness. We want to lead from dominance. We're taught in school the concept called survival of the fittest. The ones that are the strongest survive. The weaker ones die out. It's, it's that evolutionary concept that they put inside of us. We, after they taught us that, we went out into the playground and the school bully reinforced it to us made a practical application of the principle that they just taught us in the classroom because we found out who really rules things. Come on now. Get up, get up into high school. 
And you know who has the girls hanging off their arms? The jocks. The sports guys. That one that was the bully back there in the playground. He's suddenly the, the star of the show. And he's got all of that attention. And he's got all that stuff. But you know what? I lived long enough to find out that jocks don't always age good. I live long to find out that sometimes they reach their peak at about 18 years old and they're always trying to live according to what they were at the age of 18. And that old nerd over there went on to college, got a good education, got a great career and ended up getting the trophy wife that the other one just wished he had. <laughs> so by nature, we respect strength. But the laws of the spirit are contradictory to the laws of the flesh. The law of the spirit is we die to live. The law of the spirit is that we give and God gives back. Come on now. The law of the spirit is we stand tallest when we're on our knees. It, 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 it's so contradictory to the wisdom of this world. It's so opposite from the things of this life. Paul learned that he could face any sickness. Paul learned he could, he could be treated bad and he could handle it. He could deal with financial problems. He could feed, deal with persecutions with confidence. Why? Because as long as God's hand was upon him, it didn't matter what went around him. He, God was going to move in his behalf. He learned this, and this is part of my text, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm not going to preach much longer, but catch the concept. The lesson's simple, but it's deep. When I am weak, then I'm strong. Because that's when God can do what I cannot do. I quit trying to do God's part. I just do my part. And when I do my part, God does his part. Humble yourself under the hand of, the, of Almighty God, and he will exalt you in due time. But I will promise you, if you do God's part, God will do your part. If you promote yourself, God will humble you. And I'd hate to have that happen to me. I'd rather God be the one. Somebody give me an amen. In the words of Joel, Joel said, let the weak say, I am strong. I'm preaching, and I hope somebody's able to hear what the Spirit is saying. And, and if, you'll, if you feel like that you have that kind of desperate need for God, would you just right now say, I am strong. Let the weak say, come on, I am strong. The world looks on us like Delilah looked on Samson. Samson, you're strong. You've got miraculous ability. And I can't figure out where the source of your power is at. What makes you able to do what you're doing? What lets you get away from alcohol? What lets you change your life so drastically? What does it? Well, let me tell you something, Delilah. It's not our marvelous physique. It's not how strong we are, how much we work out. It's not all of that kind of stuff. And Delilah... I know, I know Samson told you it was his hair, and you cut off his hair, and it, he became weak. But in reality, it's deeper than just the hair. And it's deeper, saints of God, than just the holiness that we have on the outside. I beg you and plead with you, don't ever give it up, because that is an outward symbol of what we have on the inside. But it's deeper than that. It's on our commitment our commitment to our relationship with Jesus Christ. <laughs> if we have that relationship with Jesus Christ, I don't care what we have to face, God will give us the ability to face it. For with Christ, all things are possible. Mary, 
you're going to have a baby. How can I have a baby? I've never known a man. I've never had physical relationships with a man. Mary, that which is going to be born of you is going to be born of the Holy Ghost. For with God, all things are possible. When God says it, it doesn't matter if you can do it or not do it. God's ways are beyond our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. And I'm telling you, he can bring it to pass when we cannot bring it to pass. Your imprisonment, your problem may be the pathway to your promotion. I think I'll say it again. I know I'm speaking weak with a weak voice, but your imprisonment may be the pathway, Joseph, to your promotion. You, you, he finally understood. You thought it for evil, but God meant it to me for good. That what, what happened to me was for the furtherance, Paul said, of the gospel. You thought it was a terminal illness. You thought you were going to get stuck with this sickness until death. You thought it was the trifecta of tragedy, poverty, and disease. But I'm here to tell you, God saw a faithful overcomer in Job. He saw somebody that he could trust with greater blessings than what he had before. I took it all away and I saw how he dealt with it. I put, I put him in a physical situation and I saw he still trusted me. And I know I can give him whatever I need to give him and he's going to treat it with the right spirit. You thought it was a conclusion. God saw it as a commencement. I'll never forget, I, I felt so dumb. I was, I was past 12th grade before I ever recognized that the word commencement had nothing to do with the end of my, my high school. The word commence doesn't mean to end. It means to begin. It meant this is the beginning of the rest of your life. It means you have just crossed over to the day where you got greater things ahead of you than you ever had behind you. And I'm talking to somebody. This is not a conclusion and this is not an end. This is just a way for God to position you so that he can do greater things in you. Your weakness, your problem, what you're facing and what you're dealing with. That, my dear saint of God, is only so that you can come to a greater confidence that God's got this. I can't do it on my own, but as long as God be for me, who can be against me? I wish I could have preached this with my whole body and soul and spirit I wished I could because the Holy Ghost is wanting to drive something into you and make you understand. It don't care how much, I don't care how weak you are, how much you made mistakes. I don't care nothing about that. I care about your dependency upon the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> because God wants you to know my grace is sufficient for you. I'm so reminded of Brother Grant, and I've told you this recently. <coughs> I'm sorry. Brother Grant, cancer in his body, had a son that turned homosexual. He had another son committed suicide. Seemed like things were falling apart in his life. Everything was going down the tubes. And three years later, while he was dealing with all of this personal tragedy, crisis, physical sickness, he looked around this church and tripled in size. Tripled in size. And all he could say is God did it. I didn't do it. God did it. God said, if you just let me work. I'm, I'm struggling right now, but not physically. I know I'm struggling physically, but I'm struggling with your concepts and your understanding that you see God wants to take you in your weakness and your impossibilities 
and do something that will blow our ever-loving minds. Just like David, us going shopping for wood and ended up witnessing to a man. And I wished I could have been there speaking Spanish. <laughs> envied David right then. I envied him because he, he did it with such a sweet spirit and the guy was eating it up. God, give us hungry hearts like that. Give us hungry hearts. Now, I'm, I'm going I'm to talk to you for just a second longer. Forgive me, sis. This is, just, this is off the notes, okay? David's got some things in his family life with his children that just bothers him so much. The enemy's constantly kicking him in the rear end over some matters that he wished was different. And then God turns around and opens up doors like this. I'm going to tell you, if we just do what we're called to do, God's going to take care of his part. God knows our children are, are, are not where they ought to be. God knows all those things that are going on. I can't deal with that. But God, I can be faithful and I can trust you and I can witness to the ones you put in front of my face. And if I do that, everything, God, I'm going to do your will and you're going to take care of the other side for me. I am preaching to some people that the enemy has tried to take your confidence away try to make you feel like you're nobody and nothing and you're never going to be anything. Let me just remind you, it's not in yourself, it's in God. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Stand with me right now. I'm going to call you to this altar. And I, I don't want strong people, I want hurting people. I want people that have some problems, some issues. I'm talking to real people today. <coughs> I'm talking to people that need God to step in and be an answer because that's the kind of God that he is and he wants to do that for you. Come on, fill this altar, saints of God. Throw it out before him and tell him, Lord, I need your help. I need your help. I need you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm.